Warning, the following video contains spreadsheets. Estadio La Romareda. Our first game in front of home fans. Their first glimpse of Mustable. A chance to set the tone for the season ahead. Somewhere in the ether of psychobabble, there is a concept about how early behaviour in relationships creates implied contracts. The expectation that you will always wake up your partner with a cup of coffee, or greet them by saying, all right dickhead, and so on. When something disrupts that routine, it can be misconstrued as evidence of fading love. Against Feral, we created an expectation. From here on, anything short of a thumping is grounds for divorce. But no one watches football, even less so football manager videos, to learn about COD psychology. Ain't nobody got time for that. What I do have time for, however, is advanced analytics. Namely, expected goal chain, expected goal buildup, and expected threat, or XGC, XGB, and XT respectively. Wait, what's that noise? It's the money ball glossary. It's the Muslim money ball glossary. Well, technically it isn't a glossary. Just concept poorly explained. So let's establish what on earth I'm talking about, starting with XG. XG, or expected goals, indicates the likelihood of a shot resulting in a goal. It takes into consideration location on the pitch, type of shot, and various other factors. If, based on historical data, 20% of similar shots are scored, then that shot would have an XG value of 0.20. Over the course of a game, or a season, those values are tallied to give an indication of how many goals you should expect to score. Expected assists, or XA, is that exact same value but awarded to the player who played the pass preceding the shot. It doesn't matter if it was a defence-splitting, show-stopping 40-yard through ball, or a two-yard pass before an incredible solo goal. Not all shots will have a preceding pass, so not all shots result in XA being awarded. If you want to know more about expected goals and assists, there is a link in the description. XG chain, or XGC, is like expected assists, but for everyone involved in the passage of play. It helps to identify attacking output beyond the headline actions. Let's look at Montserrat's goal against Ferrell once more. Starting from kickoff, Bacchus, Michelis, Bermejo, Luis, and Nieto were all involved before Francho played Montserrat through. The chance was worth 0.23 xG, and so every single player involved will be awarded with 0.23 xGC. It doesn't matter how many times they are involved, it will still be the same value. Thankfully, we don't have to watch back through every chance to track it. In the analysis screen, we can hover over a shot, then click on Show Linked Highlights and see the passing chain. Now, there isn't then a way to export this, unfortunately, which means we have to do it manually. And well... Ain't nobody got time for that! That's a lie. I do. I have no life. I've gone through every shot in our opening 10 games, giving us a lovely table, a little something like this. This is good, but we can go one step further by including XG Buildup, or XGB. This is XG Chain, but excluding XG and XA. After all, they've already been awarded for those metrics. Now, if a player was both involved in build-up and made the final pass or took the shot, they will still be awarded with XGB here. If we also record the minutes everyone played, we can see how much XG the team creates whilst each player is on the pitch, and what proportion of that XG the player was involved in. I have called this Team XG, or TXG. This can be helpful in identifying whether we are reliant on one or two players for generating chances. Finally, I've added CI, or Chain Involvement, and TC, Team Chains. This just records how many chances players were involved in and how many occurred whilst on the pitch. We can use this with the other metrics to assess average quality of chains that players are involved in. Now this is a lot to take in, so let's look at some players in detail to break down what we can learn from it. Starting with our battle for the right wing-back spot between Luis Munoz and Zika. The job is Munoz. 
he has started 8 of our 10 games so far, and in addition to the goal against Bell, he scored against Real Oviedo, recorded an assist against Almeria, got one of each against Sporting Gijon, and like many a drunken lout in Pasha, he scored in Ibiza. Zika has been the relief, primarily covering Munoz, but also capable of playing on the left. He also scored against Ferrell at the beginning of the episode, and added two more. One against Castilla, one against Lugo. That's nine goal contributions combined from right back. Munoz is responsible for two thirds of that, and if we look at their pizza charts, we can see he completes more dribbles and generates more expected assists. Zika completes more passes and is a more clinical finisher. It's a good position to be in, two good players who each contribute in their own way. If we take a look at XGC, however, there is a noticeable distinction between them. Both have the same XG. Munoz has more expected assists, but Zika clears in terms of XG buildup and chain. In fact, if we look at Team XG, we can see that we generate 40% more XG with Zika on the pitch. Not just do we create a higher volume of chances, but they are of better quality too. Chains involving Zika, on average, result in chances worth 0.2 XG compared to 0.15 with Munov. It looks to me like we might need to reconsider who is the starter. At the very least, Zika needs more minutes. The eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed that one of our goals was scored by Keenan Davis. The Udinese striker was signed for 950k after I finally had enough of Sinan Bacchus. Bacchus had scored twice in our opening three games and was prolific in pre-season, but too many highlights involved him getting muscled off the ball. Combined with his poor passing, teamwork and work rate, I felt we needed a change. Now Keenan Davis is hardly the name that would come up as the solution for, well, any problem, but he does the things that Bacchus can't. He was not match sharp when we signed him, so it took a while to integrate him. That goal against Gijon earlier came in his second start. His first start resulted in this goal. And his third start resulted in this goal. In 311 minutes, he has already equaled the tally from his entire Aston Villa career. But we didn't sign him to be a goal scorer. Back to the table and we can see that whilst his XGC is higher than Bacchus, he is actually less involved in build-up. But like Zika before him, we create more chances and of a better quality with him on the pitch. Particularly of note is his low chain involvement. Davis is only involved in 35% of chances, but our overall creation is better, showing that just his presence alone is creating space for others. Davis was not the only new arrival. Chilean playmaker Matthias Marin was signed for 2.3 million euros from Belgrano, it's a lot of money, and I admit to being swayed by the scout's assertion that the fee was well below market value. His appearances have been brief, detailed by an innocuous injury early against Sporting Gijon, but Marin has been fantastic. When on the pitch, he has been involved in a team leading 68% of our XG. Indeed, we are so much better with him in the lineup that I'm genuinely excited for when he returns. Marin was signed so we could push Montserrat back into the Roundoiter position. We saw that move bear fruit with the winner against Almeria. Before that, he put his penalty woes behind him to give us the lead over Real Oviedo, and was the star of the show against Sporting Gijon, opening the score before setting up Francho in a 4-0 rout. We were robbed of his availability due to under-21 duty, so Bermejo has had his chances too adding to his two goals from our opening game with class finishes against Mallorca and Burgos. In a comparison between the two, Montserrat leads the way in goal contributions, roughly 0.95 per 90 compared to 0.74 for Bermejo. Looking at XGC, we can see that the difference between the two is marginal, just 0.02 separates them. With Bermejo, we generate more chances and more XG, but with Montserrat, the quality is higher. But there is a catch. Montserrat has taken three penalties, missing two of them, I may add. That accounts for just under 2.4 XG. Remove that from the equation, and Montserrat's average XG chain drops, although it won't impact XG buildup, where they are already neck and neck. 
This is all to say that we should probably consider Bermejo to be the starter. Not a move I'm necessarily ready for just yet, given he was dropped from the lineup because of his questionable ball control. But like Zika, he needs more minutes. I need to talk about Francho. As our captain, he should be the heartbeat of this team, and we use him as a box-to-box -box midfielder. We've seen all his goal contributions so far, except this one, which owes more to Lucas Canazares putting shame on the family name. As expected, Francho is heavily involved. 55% of all chances created whilst he is on the pitch involve him, a metric only bettered by Montserrat. Despite that, his XGB per 90 and average XGB is quite low, and this is something we want to improve. I believe this is in part due to his stops play trait, which we are currently trying to remove, but I am not willing to discount that this may be tactical too. Over the next few games, perhaps if we have a safe lead, we might start trying out some tweaks here to ensure that when he is involved, it doesn't lead to low quality chances. There is one last transfer I haven't mentioned. Ika Alvarez was brought in on loan from Villarreal to be our third choice goalkeeper. We signed him after Poussin fractured his wing against Almeria. Backup Danny Ribolo then injured his thigh, thrusting Alvarez into the starting lineup against Castilla. Surprisingly, Alvarez has been very involved. 21% of the team's chances and 43% of the team's XG has involved Alvarez during the build-up. Now in the last episode we identified that Poussin wasn't the greatest in build-up, and Alvarez is definitely an improvement in this area, but we don't expect a change of goalkeeper to make that much difference. And in some respects, it hasn't. Now I don't want to accuse Real Madrid of cheating, but 11 minutes into the Castilla game, Nieto was sent off for winning the ball. A decision that the FA doubled down on. Of course. Subsequently, Alvarez was quite busy in that game, and we generated relatively few chances. Those that we did often started deep in our own territory. That is to say that whilst data can be useful, it's always important to understand the context around it. Nonetheless, we've been able to learn a lot here. Zika should be our starter. So should Bermejo, but I probably won't anyway. Matthias Marin is incredible, and Keenan Davis, of all people, might be our saviour. And so that brought us to our 11th game of the season, in the lofty climbs of Andorra. We got off to a fast start, Davis dinking the ball over the keeper after just 38 seconds. 11 minutes later, he combined once again with Montserrat to make it 2-0. And that was that. We took our foot off the proverbial gas and coasted to the win. Zika had started and was involved in half of our chances. Montserrat's two assists was a reward for me ignoring the data entirely in that regard, and Keenan Davis is now only two goals behind his tally for the whole of last season. At half-time, we changed Francho to a Carrillero and had less control in the second half. Maybe it was down to game state, maybe it was a bad decision. Either way, we need to continue experimenting there. That result maintains our 100% record after 11 games. We are massively overperforming, make no mistake about that, having accrued 60% more points than expected. I am confident we will get automatic promotion, but we have to anticipate regression at some point. By going through the data, however, we can at least try and iron out some of those issues before they have a chance to derail us. At the top of the episode, I mentioned one other metric, expected threat or XT. XT measures each action based on whether it increases or decreases the likelihood of scoring. Like with XG, the pitch is divided into zones based on likelihood of scoring. It then measures the difference between those chances as a result of a pass or dribble. If we look at the event for Davis's first goal and overlay this expected threat map on top, we can see that when Montserrat had the ball, we had a 0.007 chance of scoring. When Davis shot, we had 0.053 chance of scoring. Montserrat's pass increased our chances by 0.046, and so we would assign a value of plus 0.046 XT to Montserrat. These values can be negative. Earlier in the move, Nieto made a backwards pass to Michaelis. This decreased our threat by 0.001, 
and so that action would be assigned a value of minus 0.001. We can then calculate this for every action over the course of a game to see how individual players contributed to our attacking output. Of course, this is not limited to XG chains. Every single pass or dribble changes the threat. In this game, that would be 708 events to record. Ain't nobody got time for that! I don't. I really don't. It's a shame, as this is what I set out to record in the first place, but it's important to recognise your limitations. In my case, sanity. See you next time.